This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over the counter markets at RVLGF. Uranium stocks continue to power higher. Cameco at a respectable $24.52. That looks like a like a 10-year high. In 2014, we hit 2647, but I'm telling you, and in 2011, it was 2830. Think of like I tell you, Cameco was the toughest trade of the decade, I say. Welcome, one and all, to the Northern Miner Podcast. It's great to have you back. Big news, the Global Mining Symposium Q2 edition is tomorrow, and I will actually be doing a panel. I'm filling in for Alicia, and so that starts tomorrow. You can register for free at events.northernminer.com, and you just click the register for free button, and you can see all the speakers. It's another all-star cast. Of this mining industry, David Garofalo from Gold Royalty Corporation, which is one of the up-and-coming streamers. I mean, everybody thinks of Franco, Nevada. Then you think of Wheaton Precious Metals. And now the third in line seems to be Gold Royalty Corp. So that should be very interesting. David Garofalo has a pretty storied career. So there should be some good nuggets there. Jake Klein, executive chairman from Evolution Mining Limited. And Evolution is based out of Australia. And so that should be interesting as well. And of course, we have all these technology guys. Yeah, I mean, we have Dean Gehring from Newmont, executive VP, CTO, chief technology officer. We have Anthony Downs, head of digital transformation at Valet. Ken Hoffman, senior expert at McKinsey and Company, who I am also very interested in hearing from. And I'll be interviewing Anthony Malowski, the chairman of Nickel 28. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. I think we have a lot of overlapping interests just on the geopolitics, commodities, everything. So I'm looking forward to that. You can see the whole list of presenters. We'd like to thank all our sponsors for joining us. And you can see them all at events.northernminer.com. And you can also check out the agenda. So you can plan your day around what you want to check out, and or you can just leave it on all day and check in, which is another fun way of doing it. So that is happening. Gold continues to look strong, as we will see in metal prices. Silver especially. I mean, gold is 1869 90 on CNBC here. Silver, $28.65. Copper, $4.75. We will get into all of this. The inflation jitters continue. And so this episode, we have Rory Friedman. And this is a uh, thought leadership piece, which are sponsored segments. Now, usually these are 10 minutes, but I actually extended it. So because I found it interesting So I made it our feature content. So I use that at my discretion. And Rory Friedman is partner at Elimity, and they help implement SAP software. SAP is a German uh, software company, very renowned, almost like the Microsoft of Germany, you could say. And so they have a lot of mining software for operations and the entire, the whole enchilada as they would say. And I just had some questions on what that all entailed because I actually don't know. So we are giving you comprehensive coverage of the mining industry here. So I decided to extend that on my own volition. Nobody told me to, but I found it just interesting. So that is coming up. We also have some very interesting news. Again, we have our new reporter, Henry Lazenby, who is burning up the keyboard with his stories here. So very exciting stuff, big picture. So lots to look forward to. And uh, Henry may be contributing to the podcast at a certain point. Um, We shall see. I told him if he wants to file a report, 
He is our new hire, and uh, sounds like there's interest in filing reports for us. So we shall see. So if so, I told him, do what you want, do a segment, drop it in. So that is also something potentially to look forward to in the coming weeks. So if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are available. And now let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, we have a story by Henry Lazenby, our new reporter, analysts voice skepticism on supercycle narrative. And this is a topic we have been discussing for months now. Are we in a supercycle or is this just transitory? It is the question that is on a lot of people's minds, both in the mining industry and on Wall Street. I would actually say the whole inflation question is the biggest question right now. In terms of the economy, let's take a closer look. Economists are tracking a broad economic recovery across the globe that appears to be gathering momentum and commodity prices are trading at healthy to stratospheric levels amid recovering demand from the COVID-19 pandemic, escalating geopolitical tension between the world's industrial juggernaut China and key mining nations like Australia and circumstantial supply side issues. On May 12th, iron ore prices surged to a record $237.57 per ton, and copper broke out of a decade-long rut on May 7th as metal for delivery in July gained 3.2%, with futures trading at a record $4.75 per pound on the COMEX market in New York, compared with the 2011 record of $4.50. So we have some analysts here. Julian Kettle, Wood McKenzie's Senior Vice President and Vice Chair for Metals and Mining, is not ready to call this a full-on super cycle. Not so fast, he says, noting that while specific commodity markets are trading above fundamentals, the fundamentals themselves don't yet justify current prices. Remember Jeffrey Christian, how he was saying how a lot of investor demand was the reason why commodities were going up in price, which was sort of a very subtle point. That's a classic sort of Jeffrey Christian observation. Let's see if Julian Kettle from Wood McKenzie is speaking along the same lines. Quote, we see it for a range of the commodities because you've had so much momentum. You always get a strong recovery following a recession. But the key question is, do we think that can be sustained going forward in terms of GDP growth? And the answer is no. So, Julian Kettle of Wood McKenzie frames it slightly different than Jeffrey Christian. Julian Kettle frames it in terms of GDP growth and that this growth is not sustainable. So not so much investor demand, but GDP growth. Quote, historically, post-recovery growth is not sustained ever. The second thing is that much of that growth we're seeing is based on debt, which has to be repaid. Also, we're already seeing inflation coming back into the system, and while central banks will allow some inflation, if commodity prices have doubled, it won't allow that inflation to take hold. Central banks will raise rates, which subdues growth. But give it about three to five years and the energy transition will really start to take hold. Some commodities will certainly be in supercycle territory. Others will be in super slump territory. So... That is Julian Kettle. Now we have Aurelia Britch, head of commodities at Fitch Solutions, who broadly agrees saying commodity demand has generally just caught up with last year's COVID-19 shocks. Quote, although supply and demand drivers will be positive for certain commodities, such as copper, nickel, and iron ore in the near term, over the coming years, an expected slowdown in Chinese growth combined with the rebalancing of the economy towards private consumption, we'll see the demand for industrial commodities slow, end quote. Fitch believes that while some commodities such as copper will face a deficit from a supply perspective, many commodities will see supply growth and have higher inventories relative to demand going forward. And Britch continues, quote, That said, the transition towards a greener global economy 
poses upside risks to commodity demand in certain sectors, while stronger than expected GDP growth in India also poses upside risk to commodity demand. So, yeah, a bit of a mixed picture there. For Ronnie Cecil, principal analyst for metals and mining research at S&P Global Market Intelligence, bullish investor sentiment has been a critical driver of surging metal prices as the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines sees major economies emerge from lockdown restrictions. So a very similar view to Jeffrey Christian, bullish investor sentiment. But that isn't the hallmark of a new super cycle and could be more akin to the post-2009 financial crisis when government stimulus drove commodity prices sky high before they started to taper after 2012 and cratered in 2014 and 2015 as more supply came through the pipeline. I think Jeffrey Christian would also generally agree with this. He also believes it's transitory. I don't know if he thinks it's going to, you know, crater, but I'd have to go back to that interview. But okay, interesting. And Ronnie Cecil says, quote, we expect the impact of recovery optimism on metal prices to wane in 2022 as economies normalize activity post the COVID-19 crisis. Currently, we do not feel that the recent sharp price increases seen for iron ore and copper mark the dawn of a new super cycle. He continues, the next few years is also expected to see a wave of projects boost copper supply through expansions such as BHP's Spence Copper Mine expansion and new startups like the Kamoa Kakula Copper Project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Brazilian iron ore exports are also expected to recover as shuttered capacity reactivates. High metal prices provide a strong incentive for a supply response. And finally, we have a quote from Julian Kettle again, and he believes that if there is a super cycle, quote, it will be thematic driven and not a single country driving the commodities boom. And this is also something that Jeffrey Christian said. If you go back to that interview, he suggested that although China was the original source of the commodity boom from about 2000 to 2010, however you want to frame that, the current commodity super cycle may be driven by the transition to green energy. So a different theme. And this is also what Julian Kettle, so you see the overlapping ideas here. And just a final quote from Julian Kettle, quote, I think there's been a little bit of confusion between transient factors and structural. Nobody argues that the energy transition is going to be fantastic for some commodities. However, it's going to be truly awful for others. So very interesting, subtle points. You see, like people are, have different perspectives, but there's a lot of common ground on this, and I think it's, it really is the question numero uno is, is this inflation transitory? That is the question. And if it is, the Fed basically gets out of its corner a little bit. If it's not, the Fed is in a very tricky situation, which is why I think we've seen so much volatility recently in the stock market and in crypto, which is... If the Fed has to raise interest rates, what then? What, what happens to our stock market, you know, which has been thriving off of low interest rates? The taper tantrum is still in our memories here. Moving on, very nice article. Uh, it's by Valentina Ruiz Leotode from Mining.com. Chinese EV makers may be looking at Western markets, CRU report says. So... Chinese electric vehicle makers, they want to start making sales in the West. China, the country leading global sales of new energy vehicles, not only will maintain its market position, accounting for half of all expected global NEVs during the next decade, but it may also make a grand entrance into Western markets. Now, NEVs is new energy vehicles. This is according to London-based market analyst CRU, whose recent EV report states that local sales will be driven in part by government policy, such as mandating a minimum quota of NEV sales for automakers and also by increased consumer demand as NEV prices continue to decline and the availability of high-quality models increases. Quote, the Chinese government has announced clear plans to raise 
new energy vehicle sales to 20% of the automotive market by 2025 and 50% by 2035. And as time goes on, these look more and more achievable. So you can read the whole report at northernminer.com. And continuing on, so the world's top 10 biggest copper mines in terms of 2020 production compiled by mining.com and sister company Mining Intelligence is the following. So the biggest copper mine in terms of production is BHP Rio Tinto Mitsubishi JX Nippon's Escondida in Chile. So wow, I didn't realize that BHP Rio Tinto and Mitsubishi and JX Nippon all co-owned the Escondida mine, and that is in Chile. Next biggest is also in Chile, Kolawasi, which is jointly owned by Anglo-American Glencore, Sumitomo, and JX Nippon. Then we have the Morenci mine in the United States, and this is co-owned by Freeport McMoran and Sumitomo. And then we have the El Teniente mine, also in Chile, owned by Cadelco. Southern Copper's Buena Vista mine in Mexico. And then in Poland is the KGHM Polska Mids mine, owned, owned by KGHM. Cadelco also owns the Chuki Kamata mine, coming in at number seven, also in Chile. And at number eight is Freeport McMoran, Buenaventura, and Sumitomo's Cerro Verde copper mine in Peru. And then there's the Antima mine in Peru, also jointly owned by BHP, Glencore, Tech Resources, and Mitsubishi. And finally, rounding off the top 10, at number 10 is the Grassberg mine, which is co-owned by Freeport McMoran and Inalum, and that is in Indonesia. So that is what's going on with copper production. So you see how, I mean, Chile and Peru account for one, two, three, four, five, six of the top 10 biggest copper mines. So you see how important copper is to that part of the world. And finally, iron ore prices hit new record. This by Henry Lazenby also. And the price of iron ore surged to a record $237.57 per ton on May 12th. A strong Chinese demand continued to outpace supply. And CRU Group Principal Analyst Eric Hedborg attributes the record price run in part to recent production cuts in the city of Tangjian in China, northeastern Hebei province, which he says have boosted demand for higher quality ore. It has also prompted mills to build iron ore inventories as their margins are on the rise. Quote, iron ore producers are enjoying exceptionally high margins as well. Around two-thirds of seaborne supply only require prices of $50 per dry metric ton to break even, Hedborg said in a May 6 research note. And Raymond James analyst Brian MacArthur is also bullish, and he has increased the brokerage's 2021 calendar price for premium iron ore. And we have a quote, premium iron ore prices remain strong and averaged about $210 per ton in April. In our view, the recent prices reflect ongoing strong demand supported by commitments to reduce emissions from steelmaking. Interesting. And he continues, while iron ore supply is expected to increase over the remainder of 2021, we believe that increase should be generally absorbed by the strong demand. And hence, we have increased our 2021 calendar price forecast. So there are quite a few other people weighing in on this article. So check it out. If you are into iron ore and you want to just know what's going on with commodity prices in general, check out the story. Iron ore prices hit new record on northernminer.com. And with that, let's turn to metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on May 18th, gold is trading at $1,867.82 per ounce. That is $31 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $28.46 per ounce. That is a dollar twelve higher than last week, and platinum is trading eighteen dollars lower at one thousand two hundred and thirty-one dollars and six cents per ounce. 
Palladium is trading at $2,938.10 per ounce. That is $24 lower than last week's quote. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.63 per pound. That is seven cents lower than last week's quote. Aluminum is also trading lower at $1.11 per pound, which is three cents lower than last week. Lead also trading lower at 97 cents per pound. That is four cents lower than last week. Nickel is trading at $7.89 per pound. That is 29 cents lower than last week. Tin is trading at $14.14 per pound. That is a dollar and eight cents lower than last week's quote. And cobalt is down 50 cents at $20 per pound. And zinc is down two cents at $1.33 per pound. So what do we see? I mean, industrial metals are lower, but they're lower from very elevated prices. So if anything, this is consolidation at higher prices. Gold and silver really are the standouts, particularly silver, up $1.12 per ounce at $28.46. And gold also making moves, but really gold and silver are the standouts with everything else basically consolidating. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Rory Friedman, partner responsible for mining at Illumity, and they help implement SAP software solutions for mining companies. This is a thought leadership piece, which means there is a sponsorship here. But again, I extended this into the feature content because I just thought it was pretty interesting. And again, I think it's kind of fills in a missing puzzle piece in a lot of what we're talking about. How do you run a mining operation from the digital perspective in 2021? And I think that is a valid question. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Rory's a really interesting guy, and I will see you on the other side. So joining me today for our thought leadership segment on the Northern Miner podcast is Rory Friedman, partner responsible for mining at Illumity, and they are an implementer of SAP software, and we're going to get into what that all means, Uh, but basically software on when with running a mining company, but I'll let Rory explain that. Rory, welcome to the program. Thanks, Adrian. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So did I get that right? Like, what exactly does Illumity do and how can they benefit a mining company? Well, SAP is a, um, we're, we're termed a systems integrator, and we implement SAP software, which company use to essentially manage all aspects of their operations from financials to procurement, to warehouse, to sales, manufacturing. So Essentially, anything that a company would do physically needs to be recorded in a system. And SAP is is a system, an enterprise resource planning tool that allows those companies to keep track of all those day-to-day transactions. Okay, interesting. Now, is this like an all-encompassing kind of software? Like, is this sort of like for my mining company, if I'm looking for something to keep track of operations. Uh, like, tell me specifically, what, what what's a use case for Illumity or the SAP software that you would be implementing? The, uh, I mean, really, the beauty with uh, with SAP is it's a, it's a fully integrated tool that has all the capabilities that various lines of business with within an operation would require. So. Traditionally, they were what's called, let's say, best of breed software tools that you know, could do financials or could do procurement, could do warehouse or could do maintenance or payroll. And what you had to do was kind of cobble those those applications together and with a series of interfaces, have them speak to each other. So what SAP did was said, you know, those interfaces are are inefficient um, and, you know, moving information between the different modules was, it, it just took a lot of time. So they, from the ground up, built a platform that was integrated right from the get-go. So, you know, a use case would be, let's say you're a a maintenance technician that needed to fix a piece of equipment because of a breakdown. 
you could immediately you know go into the system and check and see whether or not you had the the, the spare parts in inventory to be able to do that repair if you didn't you could right from the system generate a purchase requisition that would get routed to the purchasing department who could then go buy the part and sh send it off to the vendor so that you know when it came in you could do the repair so the system essentially for the most part would handle most of a mine's day-to-day -day business requirements with that core package that sap delivers now if there's something that's like incredibly niche that that a mine might do there might be a specific product that you might need to buy on top of sap but generally speaking what we find for for the core processes that a mine would perform on like a daily weekly monthly basis you know sap is would would be able to handle all of them very interesting so would you say ultimately the the benefit for a company to use this kind of software is it's going to make a more efficient company and operation would that be a, a fair characterization yeah 100 percent. number one it creates a lot of structure within the process meaning you can define certain ways of working and then people need to follow those ways of working based on you know how a, how a company wants to set the system up you know sap will come with some recommendations for various business processes on how other companies like leading practices in the industry and you know you would use those as a starting point and then you would tweak them based on every company's requirement so that at the end of the implementation you've got a, a tool that's kind of fit for purpose for that specific company and yes i mean ultimately because of its integrated nature it creates huge efficiencies you know between the different groups of people that 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 work on a system so being able to get real time information on what's happening in the operation just becomes kind of table stakes for a tool like this so when when you're going around then and how many companies do you think have adequate software of this kind in their company is it a 50% is it 80% or is it 20% like when what's your general sense of where the industry is in regards to this kind of i guess uh, operation software yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I would say that every company right now, no matter how small they are, runs some sort of like ERP tool, enterprise resource planning tool, whether it's just a financial system like QuickBooks or something, you know, as sophisticated as an SAP. What we find, though, is, you know, because a mine, mines in general mature as a company because they go from exploration through to construction. So once they found the resource and raise money, then they want to build the actual mine. And then once the mine's built, then they're going to start operating it. So just because they're going through that like natural maturity curve, their needs for a system will change. And generally, that's what we find in the market, that companies will come to us, you know, that are in exploration. They've raised a bunch of money in the market. They they want to go ahead and build the mine and their existing software isn't sophisticated enough to to manage all of the intricacies of you know, some of those complex procurement processes and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of project costs. So th they would approach us to see how we could how we could benefit them in terms of implementing an SAP system, you know, that kind of meets their growth requirements. Now, the beauty, one of the beauties of, of SAP is that it'll scale with you. So if you're an exploration mine and going into construction and you and you implement the components of SAP that you need to manage construction, then, you know, once you've built the mine and want to operate it, you don't have to go and implement another tool because SAP has all these capabilities. You can implement the aspects of SAP that you need for the operation. And then as the operation matures, year one, year two, year three, you can slowly layer on more capabilities, more sophistication in the product as the business requirements change. It sounds like this is a bit of uh, almost like an, I want to call it elastic sort of uh software in the sense like it sounds scalable like is it fair to say that this could go from you know some of these junior mining companies are literally like two people uh, and that this thing can scale from like a two person project to like a 2000 or even a 20000 person company like is, is that would be pretty extreme but can your software do that 
Yeah, no, I mean, that is what you just mentioned is a use case for us. I mean, we have implemented at Mines that literally have five users on the system and have implemented in Mines as big as probably between five and 10,000 users on the system. So, you know, from some of the smallest to some of the biggest, um, I, I think the, the real trick is being able to right size the implementation for the contextual needs of the company. Meaning you wouldn't implement the same solution at a thousand user mine as you would for a five user mine. And that's kind of where I believe Illumity's value proposition lies in that we are able to really scale the solution to meet the needs of a customer at a point in time and then work with them over time to gradually advance the solution based on what their what their needs are. The, the other interesting thing in mining that, that I'd say is dissimilar to most industries is that mines will be the first to acknowledge that for the most part, all of their day-to-day -day, day operations, they do exactly the same as every other mine. So it's very common for us to work with like mining company A, you know, who will, you know, need to go through various procurement processes or maintenance processes. And they will say, you know what, we're not unique. We do things the same as every other mining company. So what that does is it, it really lends itself to implementing what, what I would call a template based system that's predicated on industry like best practices or leading practices. So what SAP's done is they've built out a solution specifically for mining companies. And they've kind of canvassed their own um, mines within their portfolio and built out almost like a pre-configured solution specifically for mines. And then what we've done is we've taken that and advanced that even further. So what, what we offer to mining companies now is a solution that's truly ready to go, meaning it's very rare that we will need to go in and start building any process from scratch because we've had so much experience in the industry now that we'll come to the table with a set of processes and almost walk our prospective customers through those processes and say, does this fit with what you're doing? And generally the answer is yes. So it means that we can come to the table with a solution that's 80% pre-built and we just need to fill in the gap for the remaining 20%. So some like really small nuances, you know, from company to company, and what that means is that, generally speaking, when you talk about an SAP implementation, people normally, you know, they're they're a little bit fearful of that because in, in the past, it's meant multiple years and many, many millions of dollars to implement. But now, because we're coming to the table with a pre-built product, you know, those implementations can be, you know, weeks, weeks to months um, as opposed to years. So... It benefits these junior and mid-sized mining companies and that they can run the exact same solution that a BHP Billiton is running or a Vale is running for a fraction of the cost and also a, a much uh, shorter implementation timeline so that they can actually start benefiting from the software much sooner than a traditional implementation would take. I, I think you're addressing a really... Uh... A big issue, I think, for a lot of people is they're leery of the IT situation because they just see dollar signs. From what I hear from what you're saying, it sounds like the cost is scalable as well. That, you know, uh, if you're a smaller operation, obviously you're going to be uh, paying less in a sense. Is it almost like the Amazon Web Services where like the more you use, the more you pay in a sense? Like, how does that work? I hadn't thought about that analogy, but it's I would say it's 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 close. So I mean, essentially, the system comes pre-delivered with a whole bunch of capabilities. And you choose when you want to start using those capabilities. So, for example, if you're a mine that's in construction, really what you would need to use are you know core financials, you would need some project management capability, and then you would need some procurement capabilities. When you move from construction into operations, now you might need some warehousing capabilities and some maintenance capabilities. So in, in that sense, when you're in construction, you don't have to pay for maintenance. So as you kind of mature as a mine, then you will layer on more capabilities and kind of pay for what you use. I see. So in a sense, you subscribe to different services as you need them. I mean, in, in terms of how SAP licenses the tool, yes, and also how the system is actually implemented. 
So generally what we'll see is, I mean, in, in our model, because we've got this kind of pre-built template, most of our implementation ends up being training, like educating our customer on how the tool works, and then also getting like their legacy data from their old system into, into SAP. So most of our project is not actually configuring the system. It's training our customer on how to use it and then loading the data. So as the company advances and you want to layer on layer on additional capability, really it's just a matter of training your people on how that additional module works and then loading the data to support it. So for example, you know, if you want to start using the maintenance management module, you would want to load, you know, various equipment, you know, the fixed equipment, mobile equipment, you would want to load maintenance plans for doing preventive maintenance for those pieces of equipment. But the capability is there. It's really just training your people on how to use it. Interesting. So as far as, say, my people using it, if I was running a mine, let's say I hit a stumbling block. Uh, is there support? Like, how does that work? And, and is this customizable? Uh, how does that whole side of things work? Yeah, so it's 100% supported and and customizable. So during during that project that I was talking about, where essentially we're, you know, we come to the table with, let's say, an 80% c- complete solution, we would customize the remaining 20% based on how a company wanted specific features to work. And a good example of that would be, let's call it approvals in, in procurement. So every company, you know, buys tons of things on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And in most companies, depending on the value of what you're buying, that needs to get routed through the organization for approval. Most companies have that approval process, but very rarely do two companies have the exact same approval. So some companies will say, you know, for $5,000 purchases, it needs to go to a person's manager. For $100,000 purchases, it needs to go to, let's say, a superintendent for $500,000 $500,000 needs to go to a mine manager. Now those levels, 5,000, 100,000, 500,000, like those vary from mine to mine. So generally those would need to be configured specifically for the mine. Some are 500, 500, some are 5, 25, 50, 100, a million. So there are certain aspects like that they would that we would need to customize specifically for the mine. But generally speaking, that procurement process that I was talking about creating a purchase rec, creating a PO, sending it to the vendor, doing goods receipt, getting the invoice, that is all standard and it's set up ready to go for a company. Interesting. And is this a cloud-based software or how does that work? Um, SAP actually has both. So the the software is available in the cloud on a subscription basis. And there's also a a licensing model where, where you pay up front and you know pay a maintenance fee every year. So depending on kind of the economics of how a customer wants to wants to purchase licenses, sometimes they want to do the capital outlay at front and others mm-hmm. want to pay you know a monthly fee, you know, a, a subscription, so to speak, for using for using tools. So F- SAP offers both both licensing options and in both cases. The system resides in the cloud and, you know, that could be on on Google, it could be on Amazon, you know, whatever uh, data center or uh, hyperscaler you want to use. And as far as your business is concerned, what differentiates you from the competition? So really, it kind of goes back to the, the whole template. What what we recognize and, and I think a, a big part of the, the, the industry recognizes and, and mining in, in particular, because it's such a, a close knit industry, everyone kind of knows everyone. And what they do know, because a, a lot of a, a lot of them have worked at some of the bigger mining corporations, is that most people that work at mining companies have had some experience with SAP, um, either working at a previous mine or just because they have a peer in the industry that that's familiar with the solution. And the the biggest knock on the solution is that it's been too expensive to implement. They know it can do what they need it to do. It's just that, you know, some junior and small and, and small mining companies, they just don't have that that budget to be able to spend millions of dollars implementing SAP. So our value prop comes in with our template. So what we bring to the table is a ready built solution based on our implementation experience at over 35 mining companies globally and probably 60 different mine sites around the world. And we bring that pre-built solution. So because mining is a pretty standard process and 
like self admittedly most mining companies would would recognize and and agree that they don't do things very differently to other mines you know it makes them very well suited to a templated approach meaning you take a tool that's built for mines and implement that and because you're implementing something standard you don't have to spend a bunch of time you know building a solution from scratch taking requirements building it testing it we can implement a ready built system so it means that our implementation timelines are a fraction of what a traditional sap implementation would be and consequently the implementation costs would also be a fraction so that differentiates us from what i would call a typical si is that we bring this 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 template and a lot of collateral associated with the template to the table that drastically reduces implementation timelines. Right. So if the company is willing to basically conform to the template, then they can save oodles of money. And this template has been refined for their needs anyway. So they can even benefit from the template to a certain degree because they have everything kind of mapped out for them. Would that be fair? Hundred percent, and and the the other beauty is is that likely they they probably have a peer in the industry that is using SAP already, so and potentially a solution that we've implemented. So they're not the, they they're not a pioneer or a guinea pig because this has been rolled out to so many other operations already. The risk that they're taking on is far reduced because it's actually out there being used by operational mining companies. Good. Okay. Well, any final thoughts, Rory, before we let you go? That was very informative. Uh, any thoughts uh, on the industry and where things are? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, from our perspective, it's it's super interesting because what, what we've been able to do is is deploy these solutions to, to mines that are kind of up and coming and their their operations are maturing. So now we've been able to implement these, let's call them foundational systems that allow them to perform their day-to-day -day transactions. And really where, where we see value in, in helping our customers now is actually interrogating the system and getting information out of the system to be able to help them run their business better. So by giving them a set of, you know, let's just call them, you know, key performance indicators associated with, with certain processes, it allows the, the users of the system to to react to issues or exceptions associated with certain processes far quicker than what they used to in the past. And that allows them to focus their time on value add activities and actually improving business performance as opposed to just keying in transactions. So, I mean, the business is headed into, you know, this kind of exception based analysis and, and also using some of the like really, really cool, um, you know, advances in you know mobility tools and also process automation so using you know various automations to be able to you know instead of having a user key in you know monotonous transactions day after day now you can have a, a robot almost key those transactions in like ap invoices and free up that person to be able to do more value add activities so yeah, the future is bright. There's there's tons of really, really interesting opportunities out there. And yeah, we definitely like work with our partner companies to be able to help our customers. Yeah, just realizing the the, the benefits of their investment. Yeah, like ultimately this should save you money in the end, right? You should have a better, more efficient company. 100%. And if you're not, I mean, it, it means that we're collectively doing something incorrect. And that we need to revisit and, and help, help our companies re realize that value. Okay. Well, Rory Friedman, partner at Illumity, responsible for mining. And where can people find you online or where can they learn more about Illumity? Illumity.com. Okay. And we spell that I-L-L-U-M-I-T-I. -I. And if people have questions, is, should they, is there a form on there or definitely on the on the website there's a there's a form that they can fill out and um, one of our representatives will be in touch with them okay excellent well thank you once again Rory uh, for joining the program and we will talk to you again thanks Adrian and appreciate it another episode another class thank you for joining us once again on the Northern Miner podcast we hope you we are just giving you a comprehensive view of this 
unique mining sector. For all of you out there that do want to learn more about the mining sector, sign up for the Global Mining Symposium. It starts tomorrow. I will have, I believe it's at 2.15 Eastern Standard Time, I will be interviewing Anthony Malowski, but the festivities begin, I think, at 10 in the morning. So just go to events.northernminer.com, sign up, and check it out. If you want to help us out, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. And until next week, or perhaps tomorrow, take care. This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com. And you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the -the over-the-counter markets at RVLGF.